Oh, yes. They're good that? about that, aren't they? Yes, they are. Thank you for that. Excellent. Would you, would you click on the PowerPoint and do slideshow? Way over. Yeah. From the beginning. Right there. That's excellent. Is that? That's good. OK. OK. <laughs> Well, thank you all for attending today from near and from far. Um, it's great to see a number of people here in the in the uh, TCHA headquarters and also online. Um, thank you for thank you for joining us today. I hope I hope your hour is well spent um, and I hope I spark some interest and some questions maybe and maybe some thoughts that you hadn't had um, hadn't had before. Um, I'm Nick Shankle from the West Lafayette Public Library. I have lived here almost 40 years. Um, September 1st will be my official start date at the library. So I've been here for a while. Um, I'm not a native, um, as some of you are. Um, but I've come to really learn and appreciate our community um, as a fantastic place to live. Um, I'm from the library. I want to make it clear that I'm not speaking for the library. So if you disagree or if you agree with any of the statements I make, um, they, they belong to me and not to the library, not to the, certainly not to the city of West Lafayette. Um, I'm an historian by training. Um, and so I'm going to start out with a few dates, even though one of my favorite history professors said that um, dates should never be the, the mainstay of history. Dates should just be pegs on which you hang other ideas, um, give you some kind of thing, some kind of idea of what's going on. So give you a few dates up here to start with as you're looking at that beautiful opening slide. Um, there were two towns that came together to make Lafayette, West Lafayette. Um, there were actually quite a few, but there are two that, that have lived down in history, Chauncey and Kingston. Um, one was founded in 1855. The other was founded in 1860. We'll get a little more into that here shortly. I mention that because that is very close to the start of the American Civil War. So this west side, at least in terms of becoming a a settled, um, settled, um, recognized kind of uh, community was actually kind of late. It was certainly much later than, than Lafayette. Um, Purdue opened its doors in 1874, seems to be a commonly accepted. And I realized that it, it's, they started building before that, obviously. They were hiring staff and all that sort of thing. They opened their doors in 1874. So by that time, Chauncey and Kingston had been around for maybe a dozen, 14 years. Um, Ulysses S. Grant is president still in 1874. Um, and then West Lafayette as such, as you'll find, was founded, was established in 1888. And guess who was president? It was Grover Cleveland, um, who was gonna give way to Indiana's own Benjamin Harrison later that year after the election. Um, my special thanks to TCHA, to the Purdue archives, to the work of West Lafayette Public Librarians over the many decades past, um, and my thanks to Quentin Robinson of TCHA. I'm just going to read a little bit from his introduction because I thought rather than rewriting it myself, I might as well give um, Quentin the um, Quentin the, uh, the the courtesy of, of acknowledging him as as having written um, some of the early history of West Lafayette. Um, as he writes, um, beginning as early as 1836, a town called West Lafayette was platted by August Wiley on the west bank of the Wabash River, a bit downstream from where Lafayette's main street met the river. Of course, that was not the best idea in the world because it flooded. Um, so not unlike, I, I don't know where they got these people. Um, Lafayette started that way. West Lafayette evidently started that way. Hey, let's build on a floodplain because <laughs> it's there. Um, so evidently some people did actually buy lots, God bless them, um, but it was abandoned. A small settlement known as Jacktown, G-A-C-K-T-O-W-N, um, developed around an early blacksmith shop owned by Samuel Jackson Castor on the hill west of the river near today's South Street and Chauncey Avenue. If you think at the top of State Street Hill, that's basically where that, where that started. Um, Jacktown was never platted and it was eventually absorbed into Kingston of all things, um, which was platted in 1855 by Jesse Lutz. Um, and Jesse Lutz's Kingston was 
not exactly a huge endeavor, right? It was bounded by North Street, whoops, North Street, by South Street, by um, Salisbury and by Northwestern. It really was just a very small area and you can still see it today, right? Um, the, the library is located in that area. And by golly, wouldn't you know, um, they're doing some, some, uh, some street work um, on the corner of, um, of Chauncey and Columbia Streets, um, right, by more, right by the city hall and, and the library. And guess what they found? They found something they didn't expect in the street as they were digging. So it screwed up their process and now it's gonna take longer than they wanted. So if you're driving over into that area, um, many apologies, but they, they found some underground piping that they didn't expect to find. And it's undoubtedly because that is one of the, if not the oldest part of town. So Kingston gets plotted in 1855 by Jesse Lutz. Then the Chauncey family of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania um, was convinced by Henry Ellsworth, who was quite a, quite a fellow from uh, my brief sojourn into his life. Um, started a new town called Chauncey um, and started selling lots for Chauncey. I want to mention here here we are um, I want to mention that, that early certainly um, great view of me by the way um, that early West Lafayette um, was obviously um, the, the purview of our Native American communities and of the uh, the French at Fort Wyatman. And I know TCHA has gone into depth on that. I know is working deeply to get more of that history um, announced and set out for the public. But I did want to mention, obviously, that that is part of that is part of the Greater Lafayette, um, Greater West Lafayette heritage as well. Um, there we are. So. What happens? Um, Purdue gets founded, as we mentioned, um, in the 1870s, thereby beginning to, uh, to move things along. I'm going to try to do this, okay. But actually, I wanted to get here first. Um, so Chauncey, you can see that the early Chauncey, um, which is on the, uh, are you? Are we doing okay with the people? Okay. Thank you. As you can see on the uh, on the left, even though my slide is inverted, isn't it? Because I made suddenly I have made Chauncey into Lafayette. Um, so my apologies for that. I'll fix that for the next time I do this. Anyway, you can see um, the Wabash River there, and you can see a number of streets that we still have today. DeHart Street is there. Um, Quincy Street is there. There are two uh, levees going over up towards the uh, north, it would actually be the south, um, going into Chauncey. So Chauncey and State Street, as you can see, um, is coming up off of the new levy. Um, Chauncey was actually a going concern and indeed Kingston became a going concern. And so there was a formal organization to merge Chauncey, Kingston, Kingston and other random settlements into a single incorporated town in 1866, they decided, um, that Chauncey would exist. And then in 1871, a year that will live in, uh, in fame throughout the area, Chauncey did vote in favor of annexation by Lafayette on the east side of the river. However, Lafayette voted it down. So we ended up with um, Lafayette doing, uh, doing a great job with building its own waterworks, establishing police and fire protection, attracting industry, installing gas lines, building sewers, um, and became much ahead of Chauncey. Um, indeed, Chauncey um, and Kingston, when they came together, decided to name themselves as West Lafayette, um, in large part because we're told, um, or at least local lore has it, that they named themselves West Lafayette because they were having trouble getting the post office to recognize them. And so the post office would recognize something called West Lafayette. Um, someday I would love to delve into that and see if that's actually why we got that name. Um, it, it seems practical. It's a very practical reason to name yourself West Lafayette rather than Chauncey or Kingston. Um, but it, it still seems an odd, um, an odd turn of turn of events. Okay. So when we delve into West Lafayette's history, I want to look at it in a couple in 
through two particular lenses. Um, West Lafayette has always seemed to live between the cracks of its two great neighbors, Purdue University and Lafayette. And secondly, um, there is this old is now new theme that seems to flow through West Lafayette history, especially West Lafayette history since about the 1950s from the, the post-World War II era. And I'll get into that just a little bit later. Um, I wanna make note that in many ways, understanding the history of the American nation um, is also a good way to understand the history of West Lafayette. There are a lot of parallels um, what was happening nationally seems to have happened locally as well. And something that, uh, that folks who have been here um, longer or as long as me have pointed out and that Quentin Robinson mentions in his introduction um, is that West Lafayette tended to focus on residents' satisfaction and not on commercial and industrial activity. We in West Lafayette, let Lafayette do all the commercial and all the industrial stuff. And West Lafayette really decided, yeah, we're gonna be in this nice little town where you can come and live um, and have Purdue as your, as your next door neighbor. Um, and we're not really concerned about having lots of industry. We're not really concerned about having uh, commercial industries um, developing on this side of the river. And you can, you can point to some exceptions to that. Um, but, but generally, West Lafayette has, has maintained more of a residential um, sense about itself and not gone into, uh, into commercial. Certainly, there was never a railroad for all the railroads that are around this area. And I was just at the Linden Depot for their railroad fair um, last weekend. For all the railroads, yes, and Greg was too, for all the railroads that are around here, West Lafayette is amazingly untouched, right? Um, it, it's, it's, it, we certainly had um, the, the, uh, the railroad that the, com the residential railroad that came by, the electric railway, but in terms of it, big industrial railroads, nope. So let's open by uh, offering the observation that West Lafayette has always seemed to live between the cracks of our two great neighbors, Purdue University, far known uh, as a well-known community in our area, and now has an active and appreciated archival program to explore that renown. So to the city of Lafayette, where an appreciation of local city history, biography, architecture has long been celebrated and written about. My gosh, we have the TCHA here, which is fantastic on um, Lafayette and county history. Um, certainly it doesn't hurt that Lafayette is the county seat. It's the center of business, transportation, culture, health, you name it. Um, it's where people come for the art museum, for the symphony, and for many of our local civic events. Um, so I'll suggest that Loft West Lafayette has fallen in between the cracks of these huge edifices of local history and culture. So much so that West Lafayette has long had something of an inferiority complex when it comes to locals comparing themselves to the city across the river where I am sitting today. Listen to the words of this essay from, a, from West Lafayette's inaugural high school yearbook um, 1900, 1901. It's written by a yearbook editor to an observer somewhere else in our nation or even the world. And I think as you listen to these words, I won't read the whole thing, um, but I do want to read a substantial part of it. It'll give you an idea of what folks in 1900 were thinking about West Lafayette um, vis-a-vis Lafayette. It opens with, uh, with these words. Before asking your attention to the following pages, we would like to give our readers, and especially those living at some distance, a description of West Lafayette because of the way it's spelled. We live in what is known as the West Side. Remember, this is 1900. Or West Lafayette, a town of about 3,000 inhabitants, which is really no part of the city of Lafayette, just across the Wabash River. There is now, however, a movement among the officials of both cities to incorporate the West Side as part of the city of Lafayette. This would give us the use of the Lafayette Public Library and in many other ways would benefit both cities. Yes. Two levees lead to the city from the West Side. The Brown Street levee was the first built. It is well graveled. And the bridge over the Wabash at the east end of the levee was once a very good wooden bridge enclosed with roof and sides, but it is now almost entirely abandoned for the Main Street levy. Main Street is the principal street of Lafayette, extending east and west 
the entire length of the city. And the Main Street levee is simply an extension of Main Street. Extended so farther, it forms State Street, the principal street of the west side. The Lafayette Electric Streetcar Company runs a car to the west side every 15 minutes. Can you, I cannot imagine that. Every 15 minutes. And obviously they're proud of that. This route takes in what we call the loop. It encircles Purdue University and most of the north part of West Lafayette. A branch of this line runs to the Indiana State Veterans Home about four miles north of West Lafayette, making a trip every half hour. Adjoining the soldier's home and extending to the river is Tecumseh Trail, a noted park and summer resort, which during the summer season brings hundreds of people here. All the sidewalks of West Lafayette and of the Main Street levee are either of cement or of asphalt. And while none of the streets are paved, they are all well improved. Grant Street, which is the longest street in West Lafayette, extends north and south, reaching on the north to the reservoir of the West Lafayette Waterwork System and south to the point where it is crossed by the LE and W and the CCC and St. Louis Railroads. The Oakwood High School building is on South Grant Street. The West Side has two drug stores, two bakeries, six groceries, two livery barns, and Herman C. Ross greenhouses on North Grant Street. We have two many beautiful and imposing buildings. Indeed, there are none of which we need be ashamed. Above all, the institutions of which we West Siders are proud is Purdue University, well known as a technical school. There are departments in mechanical engineering, civil engineering, electrical engineering, science, mathematics, practical mechanics, agricultural pharmacy, art, literature, and history, besides a military drill. The enrollment of this year is 802. He goes on, or I presume, yeah, Roy Carr. Lafayette and West Lafayette are surrounded by some of the best farms in the Wabash Valley. Five good gravel roads lead into the west side, and during the summer and fall, one can see every morning, except Sunday, the wagons of vegetables, berries, melons, and fruits from the market gardeners. There are several dairies and also some fine orchards. I'll finish up here by saying, the morning and evening daily papers are delivered on the west side, just as in Lafayette. And besides, there is one weekly published in West Lafayette, the West Lafayette Record. The Purdue Debris is published yearly. And although this is the first edition of the Junior Crescent, we expect the succeeding junior classes to continue its publication. We certainly ought not to come to the close of this undertaking without heartily thanking the teachers who have so kindly helped us by their advice and suggestions. We also just as heartily thank those who have patronized our ad columns. Without this aid, we certainly could not have done what we have done. And that is part of the fun of this, is looking at the ads in here as well as the, the photographs. Um, to see what in the world they were doing in West Lafayette, circa 1900. Um, they, were, they were selling all kinds of things, but they were selling all kinds of retail things um, at, those, at those six grocery stores. That's amazing. Six grocery stores in a town of 3,000 people. So obviously you could walk to get your groceries at the time. Um, the plea to the larger world that West Lafayette is not all that different from Lafayette appears some 20 years later after the end of the war to end all wars and the devastating Wabash River Valley flood of 1913. Reappearing when you read this story written by former Purdue professor, Dr. Susan Curtis, the true life tale of Ray Southworth. Who, does anyone here remember Southworth? Southworth? I'm sure some people do. Yeah. It, mm -hmm. The proprietor of Southworth's Emporium on the corner of Northwestern and State Streets, the building's still there. In fact, the city, um, or as they were doing the, they, was, they were refurbishing that alley, we discovered a Southworth ad on the side of the building and they've kept it, thank goodness, because it's a wonderful, it's pristine. If you've seen it, it looks like it, it, was, it was well covered. <laughs> um, located, as I said, conveniently located in the central dis business district of the village. A man who proudly advertised throughout the 1920s that folks within range of the local newspapers um, will enjoy the summer if we furnish your furnishings, among which were Dixie weave and gabardine suits, straw hats, and summer underwear. One wonders. Beneath the Southworth Company name appears this tagline, home of Hart, Schaffner, and Marks, good clothes. A little more than a year later, 
Southworth insisted, we sell furnishings for the ambitious man. You never saw a wide awake and up and coming progressive man who did not appear the part. The many little details that go to create the effect are hard to describe, but you feel them instantly when they are there. Let us show you furnishings that are correct. But while commerce and education took up a torch of we're at least as good, if not better than Lafayette, such was not to be in the case of civic affairs and city government, it seems at least to me. For whatever reason, West Lafayette by the West Lafayette before 1920 had kind of loped along and, and been happy to be uh, compared to Lafayette, but obviously we're at least as good as Lafayette, but we're not going to try to do anything special over here. Suddenly, after the war, after the progressive era has long passed into history, um, West Lafayette in the 1920s experiences a spurt of civic growth and imagination that produced a spanking new fire station on North Street, which allowed for the brand new public library to move into a well-known brick building on North Chauncey Avenue, built in 1898. The building, of course, is still there. The Purdue Women's Club proclaimed the role of faculty wise at Purdue, and WBAA radio began its first broadcast to a large local and even somewhat state audience. Morton School opens its doors in the auspicious year of 1929. This all happens in the 1920s in West Lafayette. And it just, I, I continue to be fascinated by all of that stuff happening. It's also when Graves Bakery um, was established um, at the, at, we're, we're the, at the foot of, uh, of State Street. So obviously something, something was percolating through the air, through the water in, 19, in the 1920s in West Lafayette. Of course, none of this happened without a few bumps along the way, including a couple of tragic fires in the small town late in the 1800s that saw the city managers having to call the fire brigade from Lafayette, which of course had to travel over the river before its services could be of use, which prompted the community to finally invest in building, equipping and staffing a fire department. And then as I mentioned, the 1898 fire station. Um, there's a wonderful, if you haven't seen it, and if you're at all interested, there's a wonderful um, history of the West Lafayette Fire Department compiled um, by the West Lafayette Fire Department. And there is, well, I just happened to open it to this, to this page, so we'll, we'll certainly go. Um, there's there's um, Mayor Dennis um, mugging the camera with one of the new fire department um, purchases. Um, but it, it's a wonderful compilation of the West Lafayette Fire Department, literally from the beginning. Um, you can see, see the proud firemen there outside of the, uh, the 1898 um, uh, Fire Department building. Um, my predecessor, Lucille um, Washburn, uh, reputedly said to me, because I don't have her on tape, but reputedly said to me that when she came in 1957, you could still tell that there had been a fire department with horses in that building. And I knew what she meant. Um, so <laughs> it, it evidently left its lasting impression. Um, but it also, as I said, it was not only the fire department, it was also, of course, um, City Hall, and then it eventually became uh, the, the, the first location of the West Lafayette Public Library. Um, I often wonder why so much of West Lafayette snoozed during the progressive era that was sweeping the nation early in the 1900s, only to become awakened in the 1920s. Um, someday I hope to, and maybe one of you have a, a, great, um, a great answer to this. As we've seen, um, the 1920s saw the growing population beginning to move north. This is going to be um, a, a, a touchstone, of course, for West Lafayette history, nearly touching the Stadium Robinson neighborhood by the end of the of the decade. And in the 1930s, which again surprises me because the 1930s is well known what, for the depression probably more than anything else. Um, the development of hills and dales as a neighborhood, which promised new homeowners a country-like feel with urban amenities, with its winding roads, its well set back homes and disdain of sidewalks. It was a clear eyed effort to appeal to folks who had enough financial pull in the midst of the worldwide depression to afford a standalone home nestled in an upscale tree-lined 
neighborhood. It's also in 1939 when, uh, when what? The West Lafayette High School opens its doors, um, just kind of nestled in that um, Hills and Dales neighborhood. I, West Lafayette picks these weird dates. 1939, we're going to open the high school. Okay, just, just as World War II is beginning to break out, um, break out in a big way. <laughs> Um, and 1929, we opened Morton School just as, so I, I'm a little scary sometimes about what West Lafayette decides to do with, with opening major facilities. Um, for the most part, the 1930s, 40s, 50s, um, finds West Lafayette kind of floating back into a complacency that the 1920s probably didn't foretell but nonetheless happened. And, and I realized that in the 1940s and the 1950s, especially, he had this huge influx of students, of young male students, especially, into Purdue University on the GI Bill. And that does cause quite a bit of commotion in the community about where are we going to put all these people? Um, kind of a what is old is new um, kind of thing, because now we've got all these students coming in and we're going, where are we gonna put all these students? Um, it's not a it's not a new quandary for at least for West Lafayette. During that time, however, the Levy opens as a Twin City shopping destination, and it gains significance when Sears moves from its downtown location to the more suburban environment of West Lafayette in 1954. Um, an auspicious year for for me, at least. Sears was also joined by another of another um, number of other shopping center stores, um, which I'm sure many of us um, remember or um, or frequented and probably hold dear in our memories. Smitty's, Bruno's, the Lucky Steer. I cannot tell you many people talk to me about the Lucky Steer. I do not remember it, but it was evidently a dining emporium in West Lafayette, right? I don't remember. Hmm? I don't remember. Oh my gosh, there's a certain group of people who just. Just, just. It lasted through the 60s at least, mm -hmm. uh, I think mm -hmm. into the 70s. Yeah, because I know people a little younger than me who remember going there with their families and it was a big deal to get a Lucky Steer. Um, Same location as Graves Bakery. In Graves Bakery, yeah, yeah, yeah. And Graves Bakery was, was going big time by the, by the 1940s, 1950s. Um, housing for a growing number of faculty and staff at Purdue in the post-war years brought new neighborhood development. South of State Street and north of, uh, and north of Hills and Dales. And of course, this is when that boom um, that we all think of, of, of West Lafayette growing north really happens. But West Lafayette did grow south too. It kind of ran into some obstacles. And so the south um, stopped with its growth, um, but the North continued. Um, and, and thus we begin to enter the more modern world. But before we enter the modern world, I wanna make note um, that West Lafayette for much of its history was less than receptive to folks who were not um, Caucasian. Well, the 1920s saw a sudden burst of civic activities in our town. It also saw the beginnings of a decades long tradition of restrictive covenants attached to new housing built in areas of the city. This was not a citywide phenomenon in the sense of it was not mandated um, by, by, uh, by city law, but it certainly pops up in a number of, uh, of, of, of deeds that uh, I have seen and that other people have told me about um, restricting who can live in housing in West Lafayette. And it was a, a situation that continued um, well into the 1960s. To learn more, and it's a, it's a, it's a fascinating topic, and I know it's a topic that um, TCHA, I think, is beginning to, to turn its attention to as well. I would draw your attention to the work of the P Purdue Black Cultural Center, which has done some interesting and, and useful research here. Um, there's a stunning academic paper, a master's thesis, by now Dr. Lisa Young from Purdue about housing segregation rampant in the city. And there's a thoughtful and moving novel, which focuses on an American, African-American family's reception into rural West Lafayette, kind of actually right around the, the Fort area, the Fort Wyantan area in the late 1800s. It's fiction, um, but it is by a former resident and Purdue grad and a TCHA and West Lafayette Public Library alum, um, Dr. Bradley Greenberg. It's, it's a fascinating and, and moving um, novel interpretation <laughs> of the situation. 
going ahead with uh, the, the more modern period of West Lafayette history, um, I want to switch gears and explore the idea that what is old is new. I mentioned um, the idea that uh, the idea of lots of students coming to town and, and having some trouble of adapting them, of bringing them into the community was something that happened after the World War II um, um, increase of students because of the GI Bill. And it's certainly happening now today in, uh, in 2021, probably 22. Um, I'll agree this works well with telling more contemporary West Lafayette history. The most obvious example, in addition to all those students coming town, to town revolves around the village and the levy, um, because as we'll see, what was old is now new, and it applies to the levy and the village as much as to any other part of the city. We pick up our story in the 1960s, a decade that brought civic recognition of the growing series of neighborhoods and burgeoning business climate that sets up West Lafayette as we know it today. Fire station number two just down the street from the new city hall, what was the new city hall, um, was built in 1963 mm -hmm. to meet the needs of a growing series of neighborhoods that would soon jump Sagamore Parkway and US 52 with the building of Barbary Heights. And then of course, university farms and, and we, we continue to grow. The administration of Mayor James Williamson, who folks remember Mayor Williamson? All right. Um, uh, 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 a quick moment sidebar here. Um, Mayor Williamson's um, a wife um, was very kind and donated to the library um, a collection of news clippings, news clippings that she had um, that she had done while her husband was mayor. And it is a fascinating company. She she was just wonderful at at um, at filing these things, and it truly does show a mayor and a political administration that takes hold of West Lafayette's newfound business, housing growth, and great trek to the north, not only recognizing, but encouraging all of those activities. What happens during Mayor uh, Williamson's eight years in office? Well, the new city hall on Navajo Avenue was planned and constructed, uh, moving the city's administration from its longtime home actually um, ever since West Lafayette was founded in the village to the now fast developing near Sagamore Parkway area of the city. Mayor Williamson hires the first full-time parks and recreation director, leading to a new emphasis on developing and expanding West Lafayette's much appreciated city and neighborhood parks. And of course, now the growing trail system that is increasingly tying the city together north and south and the newly opened Health and Recreation Center is also under the auspices of the city's Parks and Recreation Department, which was pumped into full-time status by Mayor Williamson. Let's not forget the city's public swimming pool, which is still in use. Um, that was built under the Williamson administration um, as a part of the Kingston School Complex along Salisbury Street. Um, and, and Kingston School, of course, it, it, if, if you didn't grow up here, if you don't know the, the history of West Lafayette, you might well think that Kingston School was built where Kingston was, and of course it wasn't. It was built actually a couple of miles from where Kingston was, but it, does, it did at least continue the name of Kingston, which, I, which, which is laudatory. Um, Student-focused apartments, along with the number of young professional apartment complexes, really begin to dot the growing city stretching from the old Kingston Chauncey neighborhoods of original West Lafayette into areas well north of US 52 and prompting as the as this happens at least one city councilor Marjorie Gordon to take up a cause of the new neighborhoods north of the bypass paving the way for a city council member named Sonia Marjoram to make a sufficient splash to defeat a sitting mayor Dean Hart. Um, and I really should be advancing the slides. Um, so let's do that here quickly. Th this one, by the way, just to point out a couple of things. This, of course, is that top of State Street Hill, circa 1905 or so. Um, it, it shows the, the real cars coming here that are going to come by every 15 minutes. Um, and, and really linking this whole area together. It, interesting that we're still doing horse-drawn carriages even as the electric streetcars. And this, of course, is the Miller Building right there in the village. 
um, with, um, instead of Gray House Coffee, this is a grocery store um, and was also the grocery store earned, owned by one of West Lafayette's early mayors. Um, so obviously having a retail location where you're gonna meet a lot of people every day is a great way to get, to get some political credence, right? To get some polit political credit. Um, this is a wonderful um, photo um, going back to in the days. This is courtesy of TCHA over here. And you can see that it's a snowy day. You can see the streetcar um, and uh, this, this woman out in her, in her um, winter finest. And you can see what's going on. The, the village is a very active, um, thriving retail center. Um, over here on the, on the right, you can see the, uh, the electric girl cars going over Happy Hollow up as they make their way up to, uh, up to the soldiers at Sailor's Home, um, which is, I, I still, when I, when I think back of that, and, and you can still see some remnants of this in Happy Hollow Park, right? It's kind of scary to me to think that you were that high above the, the wooded areas of Happy Hollow Park on a trestle with an electric railroad car, but obviously um, it went well for the locals back then. Um, this is the 1920s, just kind of showing some of the activity the Louis Sullivan um, Bank, um, the, the Bonds and, um, and other complex over here, Triple um, X. These are all very well known, the Varsity apartment building. These are all very well, well known West Lafayette landmarks, right? And of course, um, here's um, Fire Station One and City Hall over here on the side. All, all of this still um, in existence. Um, Morton School, Hills and Dales. Um, there we have the 1940s um, with the kids out in front of Morton School. Um, everyone smiled for that picture, God bless them. Um, this is down on the down on, um, on State Street um, as we're coming um, into Lafayette um, with the feet store. And of course this up there, some of you may remember this um, kind of scene. This was of course the thriving village area with uh, a bookstore before Vons with University Bookstore and the barber shop and the drug stores just before um, just before ours moved in and became a, a real competitor. Sears moves in, and of course that makes a big difference down on the levee. Um, and there we have Mayor Williamson, yay. Um, and then Joe Deanhart, um, who kind of ends up as the mayor in between, right? He's in between Mayor Williamson, who's doing all this civic improvement stuff and, and Sonia Marjoram. And yet, under Mayor Deanhart's um, administration, a number of things are obviously um, taking place in West Lafayette. Um, as, as you can see, um, the re Republicans recaptured City Hall. Chauncey Hill Mall was developed in 74. Um, the North City neighborhoods continue. And as I said, bringing us up to where I was, women are taking a much more um, engaged role in um, in city activities. That of course is um, a younger Sonia Marjoram um, with her husband, Dale, Dr. Dale Marjoram. Um, this is, I believe, um, love the camera, right? Um, I believe this is um, when she was uh, running for mayor and getting her name known. Um, the population and business drive north became so intense in the next couple of decades, that Mayor Marjoram, who led the city from 1980 until her retirement in 2004, was heard to know that West Lafayette had three business centers or three downtowns, the Levy Village, the businesses focused on Purdue students and faculty and staff along Northwestern Avenue across from, across from uh, right, right there on Northwestern Avenue. Um, across from Mackey, and the burgeoning Sagamore Parkway retail centers. Um, yet at the same time, there was a realization that West Lafayette is more than the neighborhoods focused on Sagamore Parkway. A focus on neighborhood organizing was encouraged by Sonia Marjoram's administration, as were citywide uh, celebrations, interestingly enough, centered in the old village area of the city's international population with Global Fest and the attachment to well, the Wabash River with Wabash River Days as we know it today, um, together with the nationally funded countywide redevelopment of the John Myers Pedestrian Bridge, which all of which brought attention back to the original West Lafayette core, even as the city 
continued to expand north. Um, Morton School, first opened as West Lafayette's only K through eight school in 29, was transitioned to the city's premier community center. And in the mid 1980s, the West Lafayette Public Library made the not uncontroversial decision to expand and then rebuild in the city's original core, not once, but twice. Um, fast forward, if you will, She is on. Fast forward to the um, to the John Dennis administration in the early decades of the new century, and I think we once again see the city's move north, begun in earnest by a Democrat administration, the uh, the Williamson administration, refocused on the old but now new downtown of West Lafayette by a Republican mayor who was as interested and is interested in managing the city's growth as his two predecessors are. And tried to pick up some photos here of, of the many things that John Dennis has been doing in his tenure, um, working with, uh, with Purdue University to redevelop State Street, um, creating City Hall from um, the Morton Community Center there, um, and, and also um, being an active uh, publicity um, person for the city of West Lafayette. Um, he's, he's shown there at the WBA studios giving his monthly um, mayor's interview with uh, WBAA news staff. Um, the idea of the mayor as someone who is just taking care of the city on a day-to-day -day basis, um, which was the old, uh, the old mode of West Lafayette seems to have changed. And what I find fascinating about this kind of last half of West Lafayette history is the idea um, that what was old is now new again. Downtown West Lafayette, per Mayor Dennis, is now the levee, the village, um, which is fascinating because not that long ago, Sonia Marjoram was saying, well, we actually have three downtowns in West Lafayette and could make a really good case for that. Um, and if you look at downtown as where there was um, civic activity, where there was business and commercial activity, you could have made a good case. John, John Dennis, it seems, is trying to bring it back down um, to where we started in the first place and link it to Purdue University. Um, a couple of, uh, of notes here, because I know we're, we're running, yeah, it's still got a little bit of time. I wanted to mention um, a couple of um, ideas, concepts, people, um, topics that I that I didn't go into deeply in that overview, my overview of West Lafayette history, and start by talking about women in West Lafayette. Um, women as a group have had a lasting influence on West Lafayette history since at least the early 1900s, um, though that lasting influence was only noticed infrequently until we get into the more modern times. Um, women established themselves in, as an integral part of Purdue's academics and social life by the earl, early 1900s. There is the story um, of, a, of, a, of a donor, a, a, a very generous donor to the West Lafayette Public Library. Um, when she passed away um, in the late 1960s, Bertha Moffat left, left a substantial amount of her, um, of her legacy to the library, which was then used to re developed the library in the 1983-84 expansion. Um, and Bertha is one of those fascinating people I really do want to delve into more um, when I have time to do so. She was a Purdue graduate, um, grew up in West Lafayette. Her father, Dr. Uh, Moffat, was a renowned um, physician in Greater Lafayette. He was um, quite important with the development of home hospital. He served as a local medical director um, and his daughter Bertha um, went to Purdue, got a degree, um, a, a bachelor's degree, um, was quite involved in the literary world at, uh, at Purdue. This is all pre-World War I. It was in the early 1900s. And then she goes back and she gets a master's degree um, in entomology, which I also found just, just fascinating. Um, she goes on to become her, um, her physician father's um, office manager and, and lives the rest of her life quietly um, in West Lafayette. She was um, active in 
in civic affairs, um, but she, she seems to represent a, a substantial part of that early pre-war um, West Lafayette. Um, women were involved um, in their community from high school to college, if they went to college, um, and, and certainly an important part of, of our world. And we don't really um, dwell very much on their, their um, activities and, and all the things that they did for our city, something we can certainly delve more into. Um, the League of Women Voters became a very influential organization um, by the 1920s. And indeed, as I um, like to mention, they were the motive force behind establishing West Lafayette's first public library, the library we have today, was basically um, established thanks to the, um, the gumption and the organization of the League of Women Voters. They took it on as one of their, as, as their annual project one year and saw it through to completion. Uh, and they continue to be an active and important part of our, of our community. Um, even into this day. The political upheavals that swept across the nation in the 1960s and the 1970s, I think we all remember those. Um, women on West Lafayette's council, city council, were at the forefront of taking power in the direction of the city into their own hands. Um, I mentioned Marjorie Gordon, whose papers we have at the West Lafayette Library. She was uh, uh, a, a very uh, active, civic-minded um, woman. She served one term um, because she, as she later told me, she got done what she wanted to accomplish in one thing, kind of a Cincinnati person, right? She got done what she wanted to finish in her term on council. So she thought, well, that's, that's good enough. I'll let somebody else take it over now. Um, but she gave us like six, six um, well-organized um, cartons of her papers. And they are going to be a goldmine of information on that early 70s um, period when someone wants to look go really deep into West Lafayette history. And of course, Sonia Marjoram and um, Jan Mills, but also many other city council people during the last, during that 1970s, well into the current, um, have been women, have been very active and very um, uh, involved in political activities. I'll note as well, the rise and perpetuation of women from both parties as influential in city clubs, County Council, County Commissioners, and as state legislative members, Sue Scholler, Sally Segrist, Chris Campbell, Sheila Klinker, they're all women with West Side connections who have really made names for themselves and for this area because of their activities. The Wabash River. Um, I, can, I can't finish up by, without mentioning uh, the Wabash River because um, as a guy whose early years through much of college, my, most of my college years revolved around um, the city of Cincinnati, um, I found my move to Greater Lafayette in 1981 to be quite jarring. Um, moving from a culture that celebrated its river heritage, we would get down to the river all the time and just look at it and celebrate and, 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 and wander around downtown um, and, and, and watch the river as it was flowing by. Mom and dad would tell us about the floods that happened in, in Cincinnati and how they remember the, you know, the water going up to Ray Street or something. Um, and I, I come to West Lafayette and I discover that we, at, at least as of the early 80s, had basically turned our back on the river. It was like, oh, you know, okay, well, there's a river there. Um, let's, let's kind of ignore that and move on with our lives. Um, we called our high school students what? River rats, um, which is, and I realize there's a certain endearment to that um, term as well, but it's, it, 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 it's not a positive, oh, gee, I live on the river um, kind of activity. It's not a, a Huck Finn um, kind of thing. Um, and argued vociferously over riverside improvements. Whatever side you are on, we're on, thought about it at the time. I remember quite a few city council um, uh, meetings and meetings out in the general public saying, well, why do we wanna build something um, down on the river? Let's just, why would we wanna build Wabash Landing down there? Let's just let it go. Um, and then Tapawingo Park becomes kind of more of a, more of an actual um, recreation center. It's now kind of important for um, West Lafayette's um, 
interpretation and uh, communication with the river. There's Wabash Landing, as I mentioned, and railroad relocation, which probably had even more um, importance in terms of sending money um, down to the riverside area and making it more of a uh, more of a rec beginning to become more of a recreational um, kind of kind of uh, part of our city. Uh, it's it's a it's an interesting and it's an ongoing um, relationship that West Lafayette has with I and I realize Lafayette has its own connection and and disconnection to the river as well. Um, but it's, it's an interesting heritage, I think, that, that West Lafayette has with that, with that giant river flowing through it. Um, and finally, let me mention faith centers and churches. Um, the aforementioned um, um, Dr. Susan Curtis mentioned to me one day when we were, were standing outside the library, actually, um, that from the, from the, if you looked from the library or from Morton Center, um, and it, if you looked around yourself, 50, 60 years ago, you would have seen churches. You would not have seen the synagogue because that had moved, that was up north. You would not have seen um, a, a, a Muslim um, uh, 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 faith center because that had yet to be built. But in terms of churches, you would have been surrounded by churches in West Lafayette. And by the time we were looking at this, because this was maybe 10 years ago, um, almost all of them had left. And indeed, the library had been had been uh, a reason one of those churches had left. Um, it went away so that we could build a parking lot. And and I I still, uh, being a child of the '60s and the '70s, there's music that speaks to that really well, right? Um, but it's interesting to me that at one time West Lafayette, much like Lafayette still is, I think, had a lot of churches within rock throwing or within throwing within uh, easy sight of each other. Um, they also have moved out of the area. And based on my earlier comments about what is old is new, it'll be interesting to see um, if churches decide that it's something um, that they want to repopulate the inner city of, uh, of West Lafayette again. That may be a stretch. Um, because while retail is coming back and while certain government is coming back and residents are coming back to live in the center city of West Lafayette, not so sure that, um, that churches and synagogues and um, other types of faith institutions are going to do so. But, you know, stranger things have happened. So um, that's a kind of a, a quick, um, or at least a, a 53 minute um, overview of my interpretation of what has been happening in West Lafayette. There's a lot that you can say that um, that has not been covered. There's certainly much still to be still to be explored, but I do think, um, I, be, I hope I have given you an idea that there's a lot of history, there's a lot of goings on, there's a lot of interest in the city of West Lafayette that uh, is well worth investigating. I didn't even get to talk about um, all the wonderful buildings, which are really, there's some wonderful stuff. Mid-century modern buildings in West Lafayette, uh, which are fantastic. Um, the Samara House um, in Hills and Dales. And of course, there are still some older, very older um, buildings like the Miller Building that go back um, well over 100 years that still dot our landscape. And I, I hope that someday West Lafayette really embraces those older buildings as well. Lafayette has done a fantastic job of embracing its older heritage, architectural heritage. My hope is that someday West Lafayette will recognize, while we still have some, that West Lafayette has that heritage too, that we're not just an in-between place. We actually do have a history worth noting, worth talking about, worth researching. So any comments, questions? Yes, sir. I have a question about the schools. Um, you mentioned Morton School. I thought I understood it to be the first grade school, but I believe there was one preceding that on South Branch Street. There was there was a there was a um, there was a high school. Um, oh, on South Branch Street. Okay. I think that was elementary. Yes. I think my mother went there to begin with. And there had to be a high school prior to 1939. There, there was, there was, and that's where Oakwood was. You know, it was on the south side yeah. of town. That's Oakwood. You lost me on Oakwood. It was, it was a, the original. 
high school for, for West Lafayette. Okay, what's in a, uh, okay, it's an old brick building. It's on the corner of, I can't point it, two streets. It was there when I was in grade school. Was it really? Yeah. Oh, okay. Before the high school went to where the high school is now. Mm -hmm. Anybody? I don't know. Or, or, or. Yes, right there. Yeah. But it was it still a, it wasn't still a high school no, by the time you were high, high okay. Probably yeah. Let me go there and then there. Were you really? Oh wow! And then they finally and then they tore the building. Is it where? Corner of the streets. Uh, Wait, it's the vine versus the exposure. Of course, it's a grass field. I can go there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'll mm -hmm. check street signs. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Um, I'd like to call your attention. Oh, yes. To your book. I don't know. Yes. If you were, I don't know yes. what went down. I just learned about it this week. I do want to get that. Yeah. Okay. Typically, you can in the 1913 flood by Keith and Donald Sweet. You can look at a copy if you want to buy in a local store. Yes, it, it's, it's, a, it's one of those historical events that just got lost, right? Mm -hmm. um, it, it, 19, the 1913 flood, um, TCHA did a fantastic display for us at the library on the 100th anniversary mm -hmm. of it. There's a great collection of, of um, Photograph because they had good photography by that time, as you would know. Um, they have an artifacts. It was a wonderful. It's a wonderful exhibit. It's it's a it was a devastating flood that hit the entire Midwest area, and it, it then World War One happened. Is the is the reasoning I've heard? Hmm? Um, the only bridge that one can cross at the height of it hmm. is the railroad bridge. Right? Yeah. My grandmother had to walk across that bridge so she could get on a train to go to Indianapolis for wow. a family thing. Wow. The only reason the railroad bridge survived was they were smart enough to uh, park loaded oh, freight cars right. on it. Right. That's, that's the only reason. That's right. I remember. But, but gondolas with gravel or coal yeah. on the bridge to give it extra mass. Yes. Yes, I remember that now. I don't remember that, but I mean, I remember reading. That. I remember reading that. Yeah, I thought, wow, who was thinking? Who was thinking about that? Well, yeah. Well, yeah. Really, really, the flood. My dad really told me about the flood. Nick, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Nick, this is Leslie. We've got a couple questions um, on Zoom. Um, oh, cool. We've got somebody that would like to know the title of the Greensburg book. When last the lilacs in the dooryard bloomed, it's from the Walt Whitman poem. When last the lilacs in the dooryard bloomed. Okay. Um, I've got and a comment. All of our local libraries have it. Okay. Go ahead. I've got a comment that says Our Savior Lutheran Church at Vine mm -hmm. Fowler was built mm -hmm. in the site of the old West Lafayette Junior Senior High School. And it looks like David Gordon has his hands up to ask a question. Go ahead, David. Yes. Will I go ahead? Can you hear me all right? I can hear you very well. Can you hear well. me? Okay, good. Yeah. yeah. So um, I guess I should self-introduce just a little bit. I'm uh, one of the sons of Marjorie Gordon. And mm -hmm. um, so I grew up in West Lafayette. I'm now in uh, West Virginia as a history professor. And I have a question about um, about sort of the early development of West Lafayette. You mentioned that there's a kind of division of labor whereby Lafayette is handling industry and commerce and West Lafayette was residential or even in its early forms as Kingston, as Chauncey. Is there a sense that West Lafayette was kind of serving as a bedroom community for Lafayette, like that the Lafayette elite we're living on the west side and then commuting, you know, across the bridge into Lafayette or how, what was the early relationship between the two cities? The, the early relationship, that, that's, a, that's a great question. And I, I'm going to have to interpret here because I don't know um, 
nobody's around to to of course tell us firsthand what the feeling was. Um, but we, if you look at a couple of, of, of snippets of history, it might help. Um, it's interesting to me that the Purdue presidents by and large lived in Lafayette um, until recently when they bought the land and, and built next to, uh, across from, from the campus. Um, that says something to me. Um, the, the attempts of Mr. Southworth to entice people to come over to West Lafayette to buy his stuff. Um, uh, he was talking to not only West Lafayette residents there. Dr. Curtis really, as she was delving into this, got the feeling that he was really trying to bring people, bring money over from Lafayette um, because he realized that he was going to not make as much of a of a go of it as he would if he could bring in the the Lafayette community, um, and then the whole idea of um, back in the late eighteen hundreds when um, West Lafayette, when Chauncey wanted to become a part of Lafayette and voted in favor of becoming part of Greater Lafayette, and Lafayette voted no, we don't want to become. Um, a part of, um, we don't want you as part of Lafayette. I, I think there was this sense that um, Lafayette was was the up and coming city and West Lafayette was was still, you know, pumping, pumping like the pedals like mad to get ahead. Um, I guess the other part I would mention is that essay that I just dearly love um, from 1900, where the students are writing to this fictitious person somewhere else saying that, well, we're as good as Lafayette. We have streets. We have, we have concrete sidewalks. We have, we get the newspapers from Lafayette. Um, it, it just, it just, the tone of it just always, when I first read it and it continues to strike me as, yeah, we're, we're here. We, we have something to offer. Um, we're not Lafayette, but we have something to offer. Does that, that's that's an interpretation. Right. I think yeah. West Lafayette was, was was very West Lafayette has always largely existed since since the 1870s. West Lafayette has largely existed because um, of Purdue, right? Um, if there was no Purdue, Lafayette, West Lafayette would have been be, would probably still be just this little burg. Um, the early settlers of the early European settlers of West Lafayette, after all, um, came from out east. It was out east money that came out here looking for real estate to buy. The Chaunceys, um, the Lutzes, um, it wasn't like there were hordes of people running over from Lafayette to found the city. It was money from out east saying, hey, out west there, there's some there's some empty land and we can go into that um, that we can buy up and 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 get people to settle on sell the lots make money and then you know move on it was it was not a sense that Lafayette needed a bedroom community so much as I think it was an empty em and again I, I empty in the sense that um, the U U.S. government had declared it empty land um, and so we could sell it and make money from people who wanted to come out to come out west and settle. That's my interpretation. Yours may differ. Mm -hmm. Great. Mm -hmm. So I mean, you mentioned uh, a couple of things about the depression in the late 1900s, early 1900s, that there were a few groceries and so forth. But really West Lafayette missed out on the biggest industry there, which was back to Lafayette had 88 saloons. And West Lafayette had none. <laughs> so, Jerry's uh, chocolate shop. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> up, up until, up until, for example, the class of 1910, uh, Purdue, those ceremonial cup, those uh, class cups they have, actually has a listing of four prominent uh, saloon keepers in the bottom of their cup to commemorate for the class, but they're all in Lafayette. Was there a law against saloons, etc., in the mm -hmm. West Lafayette? Yes. Go ahead. And when was that revealed? Any ordinances? Okay. Okay. Family Man or Campus Inn, whatever you want to call it, was the first one to get a liquor license besides Eric's. Really? Yeah. I didn't know that. that okay, that's good. Was the only. Well, okay, somebody got killed, ran off the Brown Street Bridge and got killed going to the pub. 
that might have started the idea we needed some printing on the west side. Um, my understanding is that, that Purdue University was decidedly mm -hmm. dampening, influencing the uh, state government. The liquor license issuing people not to give keep them on the other the side Methodist, of the road. Methodist Church. Yeah. Morris Bryant yeah. out on 52 mm -hmm. had an early license, uh, but probably not as early as you mentioned. No, and, they did. And, when I worked at Morris Bryant, they didn't serve liquor. Well, that, and that was in the 50s. I misremember that. Okay. Yeah. It's, it's easy to do, you know. You know. No, that's a that's a that's a good question. I hadn't I hadn't looked at that. There, there was a, a place question. called an establishment on the levee in the '60s called the Pig and Whistle. Right. Yeah. Well, that right. belonged to Morris Bryant. Oh, okay. Maybe that's why. I yeah. That oh wow. Yeah, the Pig and Whistle. Is, yeah. I don't remember it, but yeah, that's another <laughs> another touch point for people. Mm -hmm. Indiana also has a law, but they it pretty much it, it would have knocked you out of the village pretty much because of all the churches that were right or even just beyond the village yeah interesting yeah good point good point and you couldn't build it close to a school and da, 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 da. Greg, you would have. Uh... Oh, yeah. I had a question about something you said about hills and dales. Mm -hmm. uh, the selling point was it's free from sidewalks, did you say? Mm -hmm. So that was <laughs> what people were looking for uh, or to avoid socialism or what? It was, <laughs> it, was a, it was a country experience in the, in the city. Uh, we, I know we look at that now and we go, hmm? but it, and in fact, if you, um, I remember talking to one of the one of the um, the shooks, and they said um, there was a field right behind our house when we were growing up. Um, there was a uh, talk about country. I mean, it was country, right? It backed into you didn't have Golden Hills yet. You didn't have any, which was just north. As I keep being told by folks who live in Golden Hills, if we're not part of Hills and Dales, it's Golden Hills. Um, there was there was. Um, Never heard of, I never heard of Golden Hills. It's, it's, the, it's the neighborhood. I, here's another thing we should do a little more publicity with. Um, it was, it's the neighborhood that's just kind of enveloped, it kind of envelops um, Hills and Dales. Um, um, I think I need to look at that. Yeah, I need to look at that. Ridgewood, uh, Carol, Carrollton, um, one of my current employees at the library, um, tells me that she lived in the oldest house. It, her understanding is it was the oldest house in Hills and Dales. And it's at Carrollton and Northwestern, which I thought was pretty far north, but um, that may have been the northern boundary of, because Hills and Dales was a, a planned subdivision. It, it, we, call, we call it a neighborhood, but it really was a planned subdivision, right? And so it had a certain, it had bounds, um, unlike a, a neighborhood like New Chauncey, New Chauncey has boundaries because it's it's been developed. It's been now recognized by um, by the the zoning folks as a a, a place a, a, a zoned area of of West Lafayette. But Hills and Dales is actually, as I understand it, is actually a suburban development. Yes, it was it was meant to be get out of town, which is kind of strange. But when you think when we think about it now, but yeah, you want to get out of that center city. Littleton used to be, um, you know, the place to live in West Lafayette. If you were a swell in West Lafayette, you wanted to live in, in Littleton or near Littleton. If you, were, if you were a retail merchant in West Lafayette, you wanted to be inside of the Purdue National Bank, now Chase, because if you were inside of the Purdue National Bank, you would be recognized as a legitimate um, uh, retail merchant in West Lafayette. It was a very it was a tight community back in the day, and it was a tight community until I'm sure many of you remember until quite till well after World War II when it started to grow. I have mm -hmm. Another comment with the wealth of information that you have here, it sounds like you could build a really good walking tour of the history of this. <laughs> 
And <laughs> in, um, it, we, we could. In, in, two, in 1988, um, the city put together a 100 year anniversary and they developed this um, walking tour, which you could buy for a quarter. Um, although I think we, we just gave them out of the library, but supposedly it was a quarter. Um, and it covers much of, yeah, covers up much of that area. It goes up to a high school. Oh, really? So it, it start it goes up to the high school in Happy Hollow Park, um, but it and and a few years ago, pre COVID, when when we had no idea this was going to happen, um, we had a really successful walking tour of State Street, where we walked. We encouraged folks to walk from, well, basically the old retail area on State Street from, um, because you were there, um, from down there at Northwestern, up to University Bookstore, up to Grant Street. Um, and we had docents at different places. It's fascinating. We wanted to do one on the levee, and then we looked around on the levee and said, well, what could we do historically on the levee? There's not that much left. There are some. There's still a couple of businesses, um, but so much of that area has, has turned over, and some of the folks have stayed, right? Sparkle Tone is still there, and Sparkle Tone was, I'm, has been many things, I've been told it's, it was a Kroger's at one time, or it was a grocery store, may predate you. Um, Not that I remember. You don't remember? I, I need to go back and look at the city directories because those city directories, of course, are just, just wonderful. If you can go back far enough and look at the addresses and see what was there. Yes, sir. Let me make a quick correction to the possible myth that was spread here. The reason why the railroad bridge did not collapse is simply it hadn't had to turn yet. The reason we had collapse of all three of those bridges was not because the water force against the buckets. It's because we had one and a half times the volume of Niagara Falls flowing through that area of West Lafayette, Lafayette, in per minute. It scoured out the, the foundation underneath that. And for example, the reason why the, the Main Street Bridge collapsed in one pier is those stone piers from the Main Street Bridge were actually mounted on wooden pilot driven into the, into the river. Oh, wow. And because of the scouring effect that was caused there, it basically took out those pilings and allowed the concrete to actually settle or the, the stone to settle down. The bridge over the railroad had equal amount of damage. And they only discovered that after they sent a diver down in there to realize that there actually had damage and was an imminent, imminent danger of collapsing itself also, but simply had not had the same degree of scouring in that area because of the, the geographic location of the contours of the river at that point. Wow. So the river would have gone, the river would have taken out the railroad bridge. In fact, at one point, they were considering damming the embankment or, or dynamiting the embankment to release the water that was flowing through there because basically you have a bottleneck that was caused by that embankment. And they were, they were to save the bridge, they were actually talking about blowing up the embankment on the west side that led up to it. Wow. So yeah, so the idea of the idea of the coal cars was actually it was done here. It was also done north of town, uh, where the Mona crossed the river there to do that sort of thing. But what that was designed to do is, when the river got up high enough, it was designed to keep the the, um, the top of the trestles in place instead of trying to go all the way down. Yeah. yeah. The problem for failing was actually down at the base and not actually at the bottom itself. So just a little bit of clarification on that. Well, and and wow. some protection from large debris floating on the on the current too. Yeah. Wow. Wow. And that's that I, I'm 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 glad the, the book has been published because that really I didn't know anything about it. And growing up where I did, I mean we had numerous floods in Cincinnati and I'm sure Louisville and St. Louis and Pittsburgh and the whole the whole thing. Cincinnati was a big deal, right? It's on it was. It was but it, it it's, we, there have been several that had been horrible. That one was really bad in Dayton, evidently. Dayton, Ohio really was just devastated by it. Um, again, because of the geography and, and the way the weather came through. Um, it, 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 it's, it's, I don't know, it's somewhat sad to me that we've lost, we've lost track of how important um, that flood was to this area because World War One happened, and attention just shifted because a world conflict is going to beat out a local and Part of the reason was flood. right before the flood started, we had a tremendous storm that came through on Friday before the flood actually started that Monday. It cut all our lines. 
one line that was left going out of Tippecanoe County to wow. the rest of the world. And so for that reason, while other communities could basically broadcast everything to the AP network, we were pretty much isolated with that. So our story never got out. And so that's the reason why, again, even if you really think about Indiana history, when it talks about the flood, they talk about Brew, Fort Wayne, etc. Mm -hmm. they don't mention us. Mm -hmm. Because our information simply didn't get out. So the information in the book was actually compiled by local news reports uh, from that period of time. It really tells a lot of stories that really it is, and it, I hope um, that someone coming 100 years from now has some local news stories that they can build a book on. That's going to be an interesting history footnote going forward, too, isn't it? Are we going to have are we going to have the the wealth of stuff that you had from the newspapers back in the day? Um, are we going to have anything like that in a hundred years to look back on? Who knows? West Lafayette still doesn't have. Actually, West Lafayette has a newspaper if you count the Exponent, right? <laughs> um, and the Exponent is an incredible source of local news. If you if you have if you don't check out the Exponent once in a while, at least once in a while, they're online. Um, the library has copies. City Hall has copies. Various places in, in at least in the village area will have copies to so the paper copies. Um, they do cover local news. And it's often a good source for stories that I don't read or see elsewhere in the area. The exponent has an interest. They figure their readership does have an interest in what goes on, at least in West Lafayette, and sometimes Lafayette, if it's if it's a big enough <laughs> if it's a big enough story to jump over the river, um, it, it'll get in the exponent. But it but for West Lafayette, they're actually a good source of, of some a reasonably good source of, of local news, which is Good for them, because Purdue needs to know what's going on as well, right? Well, thank you all very much. This has been this has been great. Thank you. You're welcome.